Good afternoon. Uh, welcome on behalf of Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford and Lindsay, the fastest signer in the West. Uh, thanks for being back again, Lindsay. Uh, in terms of updates for today, uh, North Dakota Department of Health confirmed four additional cases of the novel coronavirus disease or COVID-19, uh, one in Burley County, one in Dunn County, two in Cass County. Uh, as has been our practice, uh, we're sharing uh, gender and ages and whether they're a community or travel. Uh, in Dunn County, a man in his 20s, uh, travel related, uh, woman in her 40s, Burley County, uh, under investigation with our contact tracing team. Uh, and the same for the two from Cass County, one a man in his 70s, uh, another a man in his 90s. Both of those are under investigation. Uh, for totals, uh, that brings uh, us to uh, 1,602 tested in North Dakota. Plus, that's up 162 from yesterday that are in the system. And, uh, and again, a positive plus four from yesterday. Uh, hospitalizations, uh, sadly, also up uh, plus three from yesterday to seven hospitalized. And we've received uh, tests from 49 of 53 counties. Uh, and today we're uh, adding a map uh, to the uh, health.nd.gov uh, coronavirus site uh, that shows uh, tests from county. Uh, in terms of contact tracing, which we talked about, this is an area where uh, here in North Dakota we're trying to really double down on. Uh, we, As we've said before, we uh, like to say we're well positioned and well prepared. Uh, we've got extra lead time uh, because of the spread coming to North Dakota a little bit later. Uh, but as we've also said, we're not immune to that. We know that we're going to have uh, more cases coming. Uh, we have to continue to work hard to do even a better job on the testing front uh, to keep the testing growing. And then on contact tracing, again, we're not trying to find negatives. We're trying to find the positives. And when we find positives, uh, we would then want to make sure that people who either are positive or who have people who have had contact with people who are positive or people who've contact, who have contact with people who are presumed uh, positive, uh, that we're doing a great job of those people isolating. Uh, and, and so we said yesterday we had added uh, or increased up to 123 people that were doing contact tracing, uh, 25 of those from the Department of Health staff, 98 from local public health, uh, and 16 NDSU students that are coming online, uh, public health students. And today uh, we're in the process of adding uh, 10 to 25 more uh, nurses uh, to that that are being trained today. Uh, so again, uh, the goal here with the uh, more uh, aggressive contact tracing uh, to try to make sure we can isolate uh, those folks that have the highest amount of risk. Uh, one best practice in this for individuals, again, uh, if you <clears throat> are waiting for your test results to come back, uh, and we know that there are many people that are in that category, the pending thing, or if you are close to someone who's waiting for the results to come back, uh, you should be self-isolating. Another uh, best practice would be if you've got any suspicion at all uh, that you might be uh, contacted in the future by one of our contact tracing teams, they will be asking you, who have you been in contact with? Most of us you know, go through a day and if we go to the grocery store and we check out or we interact with people, we probably don't think anything of it. But uh, again, would be really helpful as part of what you could do in terms of your own individual responsibility is even consider uh, you know, keeping a small journal of people that you might have had contact with. Uh, because if you find yourself in the next uh, <clears throat> one to 14 days being tested uh, positive uh, or someone close to you test positive, uh, you could help save lives by, by knowing uh, and notifying public health who else that you may have had an interaction with. So again, uh, thank you for stepping up uh, your own personal uh, responsibility and also thanks to those people uh, who are either tested positive, family members or those that are pending their tests to do an extra great job of making sure that you are self-isolating. Again, with the measures we've taken so far, uh, you know, we're, our goal here, the strategy is still the same, flatten the curve. Uh, all of you've got access to the national and international numbers. You can still see that the numbers are skyrocketing in terms of cases, number of deaths are skyrocketing. Uh, and I want to remind North Dakotans that we're, there's nothing 
uh, geographically or genetically that will make us immune from those same kinds of curves. The thing that will keep that from happening here uh, is that we've actually got the lead time. We can increase our awareness and we can be North Dakota smart, uh, which is again focusing on the steps we're doing to keep physical distance and other elements. Uh, and so, uh, uh, again, but while we're doing that, we know that uh, as we head into springtime, uh, this is also a time uh, with it can be stressful. We know there's a lot of uh, farm and ag stress. We know there's financial stress. We know that there are a lot of people that have, have just lost jobs because of business closures. Uh, we know that people are fearful about uh, the unknown nature of this disease. Uh, but uh, with all that stress, uh, even though we're working on keeping physical distance. We want people to uh, use other means uh, to stay uh, connected with each other and by phone or text or Skype or email or you know writing letters. Uh, we're all in this together and we wanna make sure that we keep our communities intact and we wanna thank all of our, all the organizations, all the faith-based organizations, all the families and all the spontaneous things uh, that are happening on that front. Uh, I know there's a great article that was out today. It started here in North Dakota, went out on Facebook about some uh, family at home uh, with some young children that started putting hearts on their windows. Uh, now this has become a global phenomenon that spread all over the world uh, in terms of uh, people uh, using any items you might have at home to put a heart in the window as a way to saying a shout out to a neighbor or someone who's walking down the street to say we're all in this together. And as part of our, uh, our uh, uh, work here at the state of North Dakota, uh, we're working tonight uh, to uh, light up the windows in the state capitol into a, oh, it's, I'm getting the signal now that it'll be tomorrow night, uh, we'll have the lights up on the, in the capitol, where, uh, which we've done, uh, we do that on New Year's and we do that whenever the NDSU buys and win a national championship. But on the south side of the Capitol, we will have a, uh, a giant heart um, to participate in that. So keep those hearts uh, flowing. Uh, I want to say to uh, those people uh, that are listening online, thank you for your time. Thanks for being part of the process. Thanks for getting the information out. We know there's a feed that goes on, uh, particularly on Facebook Live. Uh, we appreciate your input and feedback. We're watching that feed. Uh, we are listening uh, to the comments that are coming in. And uh, one of those things we've heard a lot about from people watching online uh, relates to student loans. And so today we're announcing uh, a two-part response uh, to suggestions that we consider providing relief for individuals who've got student loan debt with the Bank of North Dakota. As you know, we're fortunate to be the only state in America that has its own bank. And one of the things that that bank does, is it has over a billion dollars of student loans uh, out. Uh, so effective immediately, uh, if you're a student loan borrower with the Bank of North Dakota, you can defer your student loan payments uh, for six months. Uh, interest will continue to accrue, uh, but they'll be no uh, you know, payments or penalties if you're not paying your loan. Uh, to do this, uh, borrowers and co-signers need a simple online form uh, at bnd.nd.gov slash COVID or call the Bank of North Dakota at 800-472-2166. Uh, but this is an opt-in program. So if you wanna participate in this, you've got to either go online or call uh, and borrowers can decide if it's the right time uh, for them to move or not because some people may be in a position where they wanna keep paying uh, and get their student loan paid for as quickly as possible, but this is uh, totally up to you. Uh, the second part of this is has to do with interest rates. Uh, interest rates for variable rate borrowers on student loans is gonna be decreasing on April 1st. Um, People that signed up for that, uh, that's part of the contract they had as a variable rate uh, borrower. Uh, those interest rates are gonna drop by just a little bit over 1% uh, and their payment amounts will be updated at that time. Uh, additionally, uh, and not a requirement, but on a, uh, a, a decision made uh, by the Bank of North Dakota leadership and affirmed uh, today by the North Dakota Industrial Commission, which includes Attorney General Wayne Stengem and Ag Commissioner Doug Goring and myself, uh, is that uh, all borrowers that have a fixed rate student loan that had a fixed rate will receive a decrease in their interest rates by 1% uh, at the time when the bank is able to uh, get the software systems to do that. Uh, that may be June, June 1st before that happens. Uh, there's apparently 69,000 uh, student loans in that category uh, that would have to be modified. Uh, but uh, again, that's a, uh, uh, a in total almost a $5 million uh, decision uh, made today to uh, again try to support uh, students uh, with that decision. 
Uh, accounts of borrowers who are delinquent are being brought current. Their payments will be deferred for six months. Uh, but again, I want to give a shout out to the BND team who's been working around the clock on this and other items, uh, and also to President and CEO Eric Hardmeyer uh, uh, for their work. Uh, and uh, in, in that they've been doing, including meetings with them last night and again today. We know this is a challenging time for borrowers of all kinds, and especially for students. We want to provide assistance that has a meaningful impact. Uh, the federal student loan program is automatically providing deferment of payment for all borrowers. We're, we're in North Dakota approaching it a bit differently. So instead of assuming that everybody wants to defer, we're giving those students a, chance, a choice uh, because, again, some of them may want to postpone. Others may want to keep paying right now to take advantage of this reduced rate. Next topic. Uh, if you're not from North Dakota or you're not from transportation, you probably have never heard what a frost law is. Uh, but frost laws, as they're known, uh, have to do with uh, transportation, have to do with weight limits on our roads. Uh, and uh, and we have an uh, executive order that we've signed uh, today uh, relating to this, two changes within our Department of Transportation. Uh, NDDOT, uh, first thing, doesn't have to do with frost laws, but NDDOT conducts administrative hearings. Uh, and those administrative hearings include things like suspensions or revocations of driver's license. Uh, for if for violations that may have occurred moving violations they do that in person before dot hearing officers generally these are but uh, generally these have been held over the telephone the option of hearing live uh, hearing officers available the new executive order enables dot to continue these administrative hearings by telephone or by video conference if the appropriate technology is available um, to fit facilitate the regular and uninterrupted movement of goods and traveling within uh, North Dakota. The second one, a part of this executive order relates to frost laws. Uh, so all state highway restrictions have been lifted. Uh, however, the director of DOT under this executive order, if any state highway is being negatively impacted due to load weight, uh, he may reinstate uh, restrictions on state highways as needed. So that's executive order for DOT. Two things, uh, video conference or telephonic uh, administrative hearings and uh, elimination for now suspension of the all the weight limits uh, or, or AKA frost laws. Uh, next up, I want to introduce uh, Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford. A as you know, he's been uh, shoulder to shoulder with me through this entire uh, emergency process. Uh, for those that might not be familiar with all the duties of Lieutenant Governor uh, in North Dakota, the Lieutenant Governor's got a full plate. Constitutionally, the Lieutenant Governor chairs the State Investment Board, which uh, manages billions of dollars, uh, chairs the Capitol grounds Planning Commission uh, is president of the Senate when they're uh, in session, uh, leads the Aeronautics Commission, which is the group that has got broad range of responsibilities related to all the things that North Dakota is doing to lead the nation in unmanned aerospace, and other duties as assigned, which is about another 100 hours a week of stuff uh, that I give Brent. Uh, but as the former mayor of the, one of the fastest growing communities in the, the nation and someone who's a, a budget whiz, uh, he's been a great Great help as we work our way through this. And one of the things that Brent's been doing is holding uh, regular calls uh, with over 250 mayors from across the state. I think he's held three of them. They had another one today. Uh, Brent is going to give an update on that and uh, will be available for questions afterwards. Here's Brent Sanford. Thank you, Governor. Usually we would shake hands at that point, but not today. We're getting good at distancing. Um, before I give some remarks. I want to thank you, Governor, on behalf of all North Dakotans for your calming leadership during these challenging times. Um, we, f we feel a lot better with you at the helm. I can tell you, I hear about a lot of words of gratitude every day on that effect, so thank you. But as the Governor mentioned, I was able to be on a call today with over 250 mayors and city auditors from across North Dakota. We updated the group on the executive orders and the current situation at the state level from testing status, as always, to remote work initiatives, making sure that the state staff will be out doing their work, as always. We're continuing governance, but we're actually letting people work from home where necessary and where they can. Uh, we also answered a lot of questions and provided guidance on how to best inform and support their communities in these, in these challenging times. Questions are focused on 
our public space executive orders where the bars, the restaurants, the gyms, the theaters, etc., were um, ordered to be closed and, and what type of effect you might have in rural areas versus city versus large cities is, differs, as you can imagine. They ask questions about the K-12 status, um, unemployment claims, workers' comp claims, processes, and of course, budget planning. And I can tell you, I'll tell you the same things I told them. It's, it's, that's definitely a work in progress for all of us. You can look forward to more information coming as we get through the forecasting and look at what the effects might be from this downturn. Uh, our office is also having daily briefings with legislative leadership. As we all know, legislators are fielding a lot of calls from constituents as well. And we have had an open dialogue with them to, to help address those concerns as well. So I wanna assure citizens, fellow elected officials and businesses that we are fully committed to working with our local, state and federal partners for the best possible outcome. So thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your calm. And we look forward to working through this. We feel we will come out better in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brent. And I also want to take this time to thank all those mayors, all those uh, city auditors, all those city commissioners, as we know in North Dakota, that even in our largest cities, the mayor jobs are part-time times. We really got citizens that step up and help lead their communities. And we, uh, they're, uh, uh, we like to say earning their paychecks right now because a lot of them don't get paid, but they're uh, definitely, there's a lot of hardworking people out there in the communities. And Brent, thanks for, uh, for working with them and getting their feedback into our decision-making. Uh, next topic. Uh, it uh, has to do with uh, with uh, long-term care. Uh, we've discussed uh, many times here about trying to flatten the curve, and the reason why we're doing that is to try to protect uh, the available medical resources so that if we get people get into critical care situations, that we've got enough staff, we have enough hospital rooms, we've got enough ventilators, we've got enough personal protective equipment to do that to be able to take care of them because we can lower the mortality rate uh, of this, this deadly virus uh, if we're able to provide proper care. So when we think about all the actions that we're doing as a state, we're doing that to try to protect that are most vulnerable and we've given that sizing uh, before in these, in these conferences and these briefings uh, that that represents about 20% of the people in the state of North Dakota because we've got such long lifespans in North Dakota and so many people that are you know over the age of 65. And we also, you know, unfortunately, have a number of people who've got underlying health conditions, particularly di diabetes in our state, uh, where again, we want to make sure that we're protecting them. Uh, many of them live in long-term care facilities. We have 80 skilled nursing centers and other assisted living around the state. And one of the directives that we gave uh, over a week ago was to conduct site visits of every long-term care facility in the state. Uh, we did that through our Department of Health with, to make sure that they were following the Department of Health's memo, which was issued way back on March 12th, uh, recommending long-term care providers uh, limit access to those homes as recommended by the American Healthcare Association. Um, on March 16th, our Division of Health Facilities brought together its entire survey staff, but they did that virtually to train them on this new mission. Uh, they crafted a series of 30 questions uh, to review with each long-term care facility. And, uh, in, and again, in addition to those 80 skilled nursing, the 64 basic, 75 assisted living, total of 218 facilities. Uh, the 20 staff members were trained and assigned to all those 218 um, facilities. They hit the road uh, this Monday, uh, or, or excuse me, last week. And by Wednesday, they'd cleated, they'd, by, in three days, they competed all 218 visits. The visits took one to two hours, consisted of a collaborative visit with staff. Areas of weakness were identified and discussed and suggested help them prepare for what was likely coming with COVID-19. Uh, the health department, North Dakota Department of Health, has heard many positive feedbacks from these visits. We'll continue to assist these facilities in any way we can. We'll continue to work closely with the Long-Term Care Association. And again, this is about protecting those that are most vulnerable. You know, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, uh, including many uh, military veterans, including many uh, Vietnam War vets, you know, and going Korean War and a few that are going all the way back to the greatest generation. But we want to make sure that we're caring uh, for all these individuals. So this is a shout out to the, uh, the 20 staff members that made it to all 218 facilities and to all the frontline staff at those nursing homes. So far, we have not had any reported uh, COVID uh, within those nursing homes, and uh, we hope to keep it that way. So again, uh, thanks. We know it's hard for families not being able to visit your, your uh, loved ones, but uh, reach out to them another way and let's, uh, let's keep them safe. 
Uh, last thing, a uh, couple things to close on here, uh, other kind of tidbits, but one is uh, has to do with uh, personal responsibility. Uh, we've talked about this thing before, but uh, again, in North Dakota, uh, we're doing this with a, a mix of two things. I mean, if you have, you know, massive mandatory uh, required shutdowns, which some people clamor for, but no one follows those orders. It doesn't work. Uh, if you have no mandatory government shutdowns, but everybody's practicing uh, personal responsibility, uh, you know that could work great. Uh, we're trying to do a blend here of the right, uh, the right touch in terms of government uh, guidance and restrictions at a state level, uh, delegating authority to, to the locals, but also you know strongly relying on what's made North Dakota great uh, forever, which is the people that have lived here have always exhibited tremendous personal responsibility. And so as we think about that, uh, again, washing your hands is the number one best way, uh, you know, best way to get things done. Uh, we know that, uh, that you have an opportunity to get outside. Uh, walking could become your new best friend uh, as a way to enjoy and sort of learn. Humans were built for walking. Uh, we've kind of built a society around uh, moving around in automobiles and walking might seem like a, a chore sometime, but I would recommend if you have haven't gone for a walk for a while, um, I, I might recommend it to just try it for people and you, you might turn out that you'll uh, rediscover uh, what humans were actually built for. Again, uh, on, in terms of uh, contact, uh, again, learning the right way uh, to cover a cough, cover it with you know, either a Kleenex or tissue or into your sleeve. Uh, and if you do end up coughing in your hand, make sure that you are uh, washing your hands uh, quickly. Uh, and, and then again, use an opportunity to clean and disinfect surfaces. And then again, as we're saying, keep social distance six feet. People are you know, asking all the time about what they can or can't do. You can do just about anything you want to as long as you're following these rules and staying more than six feet away from, uh, from other people. Uh, and again, as the weather gets nicer, there's a, a lot of things uh, that you, you can do. I mean, again, if you want to take your kids to the playground uh, go there bring along a bottle of hand sanitizer and uh, and then and, and again uh, uh, you have an opportunity to keep physical distance but still get you know activity uh, people have been asking us about mass gatherings uh, again uh, we've we've been uh, encouraging people uh, to to not hold or avoid mass gatherings uh, and and again our faith-based community this last weekend uh, you know complied I think almost completely across the state found other ways to deliver uh, their messages and stay connected with their congregations and we applaud them for that for that work uh, and so the the, you know, non-essential gatherings, again, the guidance remains the same that we've given, but we've had had some uh, springtime uh, is when uh, the ranchers in our state are moving, moving their calves and heading to the sale barns. Uh, and again, the, uh, the, but the, in terms of the sale barns themselves, uh, if you're there because you're a buyer or a seller, you should be there. Uh, if you're there because this is where you like to go hang out and you're just part of the public, uh, you might be considered uh, non-essential to that activity and out of respect for the, the, the ranchers that we need to keep healthy in our state. Uh, again, if, you're, if you've got, don't have actual business activity to, to transact there, we would ask you to stay away. Um, and, and again, if the sale barns are providing uh, food at those gatherings, uh, we'd ask that that be served uh, by whoever's hosting that in a manner that's acceptable for food service Services or asking, uh, you know, people to bring their own or discontinue food, food service, but figure out a way to get it done. But just use common sense as a way to mitigate risk, uh, you know, create opportunities. Some of the sale barns can do, uh, you know, video uh, and have offered that in the past. Uh, if you haven't, this is a good time, just like our schools, just like anything else, to think about how do you up your technology game uh, to do that. But make sure, again, the main thing is make sure there's adequate space to maintain and accommodate social distancing. And of course, if you're sick, if you're a buyer or a seller and you're sick, again, just like we would ask people to stay home from work, I know that ranchers might say there's nobody else I can send, but this is a time when maybe neighbors can help neighbors or you've got family members or, uh, you know, that... <clears throat> son or daughter that you've always wanted to come back into the ranching business, uh, stay home if you're sick, maybe they'll come home, maybe they're out of college right now, maybe they're not at work, maybe they can come home and help out. But again, working together, we can work through these uh, in a common sense way and allow people to uh, 
keep their, their livelihoods uh, moving, particularly in the important area of agriculture and food, because this is a essential. Uh, we're at the beginning, we're at the end of the supply chain for a lot of medical supplies. We're at the beginning of the supply chain for feeding the world, and uh, North Dakotans have to keep doing our end on uh, feeding the world. Uh, another topic, uh, as, you, as you know from these calls, we've been uh, connecting with all of uh, our our neighbors uh, and had uh, reported had report outs yesterday on calls we'd had with uh, Governor Christy Nome and uh, Governor Steve Bullock from Montana. Uh, we're uh, working to schedule a call with uh, Governor of Minnesota for tomorrow, and uh, today had a great conversation with the uh, Premier Palliser, Brian Palliser, who's the Premier of Manitoba. Uh, they've been doing a great job up in Manitoba, and when our neighbors do a great job, we benefit. So we always want to be grateful for the work that they're doing. Uh, Manitoba is uh, among the provinces in Canada uh, near the top in terms of testing uh, per capita. They've completed 4,300 tests up there, and they've uh, they are doing a, a great job in terms of how they're managing things. So shout out uh, to them uh, for uh, being a great great neighbor on our northern border. And we know that for a lot of North Dakotans that live close to the border, uh, there's a lot of uh, economic activity that goes back and forth. Canada's our lar largest trading partner, billions of dollars of trade going on every year and across all the ports where we move back and forth across the borders. And so again, uh, we're uh, thinking about our friends and neighbors that are uh, on the other side of the border and knowing that this virus doesn't really pay attention to borders. It's important that uh, we're, we understand that we're all we're all humans living together on the Great Plains, and it's important that we uh, stay connected with each other. So uh, <clears throat> in closing, uh, for our former remarks today, uh, you know, I've always opened with gratitude today. I want to close that there's so many people to be grateful for, but rather than uh, me going on on that list, I thought I would just share one of my favorite quotes. People often ask me about how gratitude is, uh, you know, built into my life, and I try to think that it's built in everywhere, but uh, this quote by Melody Beatty uh, really, uh, I think, sums it up and is really appropriate for today. Uh, so this is a gratitude note for everybody in North Dakota. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos to order, confusion to clarity. Gratitude can turn a meal into a feast, can turn a house into a home, a stranger into a friend. It turns problems into gifts, failures into successes, the unexpected into perfect timing, and mistakes into important events. It can turn a existence into real life and disconnected situations into important and beneficial lessons. Gratitude makes sense of our past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. Gratitude makes things right. And that's a quote by Melody Beatty, but I think there's a number of things in there uh, that are important when we talk about gratitude makes sense of our past, uh, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. Uh, I would just say again, we've got so much to be grateful here in North Dakota, including all the people that are working around the clock uh, to make sure we're prepared as best we can be uh, for for the situation that we're in. I want to thank all of them, you know, from uh, health care providers, first responders, mayors, leaders, uh, everybody in state government, Team North Dakota, thanks for all the great work you're doing. Uh, we had another day to day with a slow, small increase in positive counts, uh, but uh, Every day that we every day that we have one of those days is buying us time uh, to make sure that we can both expand our available medical capacity and flatten that curve. And if we can do that, we're going to be working together to save lives. So thank you all. And now uh, Brent and I are available for questions. The seven in the hospital right now, or seven who have been hospitalized, how many of the seven are still in the hospital? Uh, all of those. Question, the question from uh, radio legend Dave Thompson was how many are still uh, hospitalized, and that's plus three uh, from yesterday, so seven, but everybody that we've reported earlier this week still remains in the hospital. Uh, could you give the ages of those who are in the hospital? Uh, can, I, I do not have the ages uh, at hand, and we have not been releasing those. For Lieutenant Governor Sanford. Yes, Dave. You did have con conversations with mayors. Yes. Did Prairie Dog come up? It did. The question is, did Prairie Dog come up in the, in the conversation with the mayor? So Operation Prairie Dog 
is one of those last buckets to fill if you follow legislative session where infrastructure dollars are going back out to local jurisdictions. And so it's of, it's of quite a bit of concern as to with the drop in oil prices if the prairie dog bucket will fill. And if there's projections being worked on, we're not ready to put those out, but we've got you know sensitivity analysis on if the if the oil price is at such level, what does it look like as far as the the, the trust funds are working? Um, also, what does the sales tax budget look like going forward? And so we're 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 optimistic that there might be some movement on the oil price if there could be some work at OPEC plus in the time being. But um, it's all part of the equation as far as where the sales tax comes in. But the yes, the municipalities are already planning on what might be an option because their plans had been made for for the dollars that were shown as to what they might use those dollars for. So it was a concern. That's what was my comment about budgeting will be a topic going forward for the state and how it affects the locals. Governor. Um, the president alluded that he said he wanted to start relaxing a lot of the regulations around Easter. Is that a deadline that you have discussed? Uh, the question was, uh, have we discussed relaxing uh, any of the guidelines or any of the restrictions around Easter? Uh, and, and it's being discussed at the national level. The question, have we discussed? The answer is no. I think it's uh, difficult uh, t for, for us. We're on the tail end. Of, of this pandemic. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's moving across the world. We saw it move from China to Europe uh, to the United States. Uh, and, you know, picking one date uh, for the entire United States, uh, you know, likely wouldn't make sense because I think, uh, again, this is why it's great that we got 50 state leaders and 50 states, 50 governors doing a great job leading stuff because each state's going to have a different situation, uh, or at least regionally, we're going to have different situations. And so our, uh, you know, we may be put on controls later than some places, and we're still ahead of the game. Uh, but that may mean that we have to keep them on longer here in North Dakota than pl other places that that uh, that are that are relaxing them. I want to follow up with the earlier question about people being hospitalized. But 36 cases, how many have recovered? Question was: We have 30. We have 36 positive, and the question is how many's recovered. Uh, what we know is that there uh, are likely many people in North Dakota who have coronavirus who were not po who not tested. You know, we had very few tests at the beginning. Uh, we have we have another group that we're through our expanded contact tracing that we're trying to track down. And this is a group we'll call presumed positives. We don't have any uh, numbers, but I'm sure maybe you've, some of you've seen on social media where people said, hey, I did telemedicine, I talked to the doctor, I described my symptoms, I described where I went, uh, and they were told by a medical professional, hey, you likely have coronavirus, uh, there's no treatment for it uh, unless you your symptoms escalate. So the recommendation like would be if you get the flu, which is, you know, stay home, isolate, drink fluids, uh, watch your temperature, all the guidance they would, they would give those individuals. Uh, and so then if there's no difference in medical, um, you know, in, in the medical recommendation, some of those people early on did not get did not get tested, but were presumed presumed positive. Those folks, uh, we uh, we know are uh, we're recovering, and we know from some of the uh, medical organizations the way they're handling their protocols is if they have someone who's a presumed presumed positive, they ask them to stay home. They keep checking on them. If they become worse, then that's when they would come and be, you know, become hospitalized. So uh, we, 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 we don't have the data, but we have a presumption that just like other places in the country, the majority of the people uh, that, that, con that, re that contract COVID, the majority of the people, if you don't have an underlying health condition and you're not elderly, the majority of those people are recovering and they're recovering at home. I'm wondering if you had an update on the unemployment claims uh, made for, I guess that would be yesterday or today, um, and if there had been any shift in the industries from which those people were applying for unemployment. A two-part question from uh, Jeremy Turley from Foreign News Service. Uh, uh, <clears throat> any updates? Uh, we'd given the uh, unemployment counts uh, earlier, uh, which again, uh, a run rate of 400 a week 
two weeks ago, 600 last Wednesday, 1600 Thursday, 2594 Friday, 2224 over the weekend. Uh, that's a record. Uh, Friday was a record. Uh, Monday, 1941. Uh, and today, as of uh, just before walking in here, uh, 967. So what that gets you to in one week is uh, about 74 short of uh, 10,000. So 9,926 unemployment and claims uh, in just uh, one week. Uh, that would also be a, a record spike in terms of any change. And that was uh, uh, still, still the majority of that through the weekend was uh, energy related. Uh, I don't have the data, Jeremy, today from, uh, but we can get it for you on if we've got industry breakdown on the stuff coming from today. <clears throat> Lane? This question might be more suited for Mylan, but uh, one of our reporters was in Minot today for their uh, press briefing that they're going to start doing weekly. And he said somebody there mentioned that they're changing the uh, guidelines for how they test people. And he was just, we were curious what, that, what those guidelines were being changed to and if that was just a Minot thing or if it was statewide. Uh, question uh, from Lane Hinkins of KX News uh, was, uh, Press briefing in Minot, Minot indicated they were changing some testing protocols and wondering if that was a change in the state uh, or just a Minot thing. I think that was the question. Uh, and uh, the answer would be that would be that would be the medical provider in Minot that made that statement. We've ch made no changes on our guidance uh, here from the state of North Dakota. And the guidance is, is Mylin, is, my, did, come on up if you want to add to that. If there is a change that I didn't know about in the last few minutes or... Mylan, Mylan Tufty, our state health officer, with a clarification. So this um, afternoon, we did send out a health advisory, and that updated the guidance just to provide a little bit more insight into the symptoms for individuals to look for, and also relax the epidemiological risk and transmission risk to say, if you have these symptoms and no source of exposure has been identified, please test. And then it also just reinforces that prioritization that we had listed before. But it was more about letting people know about which symptoms to look for. Do you want to share those symptoms? Yes. Um, fever and cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, chills, myalgia, which is that body ache, and then fatigue. Um, so fever, just to describe that a little bit more, we're looking at fever right now at 100.4, but if you're older, like around 60 and older, um, we, you might have a lower core body temperature, and that temperature that we might see a fever at is 99.6, and our healthcare providers know that. Thank you. Governor, um, over the weekend, your office and DPI will be evaluating a lot of distance education plans that are coming in from around the state. What exactly is that evaluation process going to look like? Uh, question was, uh, we're going to be evaluating a lot of uh, uh, distance education plans that are coming in. Uh, and w what's the evaluation going to look like? Uh, DPI is going to take the lead on this with the governor's office as, a, as the backup. The those are due by this Friday. Uh, some of them are, have already been submitted. Uh, DPI has been split into a set of teams. Uh, so there'll be you know one plan for each of the 175 different school districts that we have in the state. And those uh, plans will be uh, you know grouped uh, in terms of uh, different criteria. Uh, I think one of those will be, you know, the largest school districts might be evaluated, say, by one team and, you know, small class B rural districts by another. So we're not comparing small to large. Uh, we are <clears throat> looking to make sure that we're, uh, you know, meeting all the mission requirements that we're looking for, because again, we've got uh, the, the, you know, the important mission of our districts that includes, you know, trying to reach those 113,000 uh, students that are in our K-12 system uh, includes an a academic mission, uh, which they need to fulfill. They've got the nutrition mission they need to fulfill and a special education mission. And, and of course, nutrition relates to USDA, uh, the special education department of education. So we're trying to work through some of the new federal waivers that are coming on nutrition, uh, just to make sure that all the plans uh, are incorporating the new flexibility that, 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 uh, 
uh, K-12 has been given. Uh, and, but importantly, we're going to try to make sure uh, that, <clears throat> that they've got the d delivery mechanisms they are, that they can. And then, if, again, if we've identified shortfalls, if we've got places where, uh, again, there may be equipment or broadband, you know, where can we team up with uh, private sector uh, partners to help make that happen to make sure that we've got a equitable opportunity for all students to continue their their learning uh, but we're also looking for we're looking for innovation we're looking for creativity and we're looking for people that are using uh, I'm going to say good old-fashioned techniques uh, uh, you know including reading books and book reports uh, you know those things are all it's all on the table uh, in terms of how we want to try to keep delivering educational experiences uh, during this time frame uh, we talked earlier again the legislature had uh, wisely passed this uh, uh, innovation uh, in education bill two years ago and some school districts and that's another place again where we're uh, you know pointing people towards to take a look at that legislation because that uh, some of the school districts through their innovation education waivers had, had essentially done much of the work that we're asking them to do now as part of this planning process but we're looking forward to seeing those plans and we know there's uh, we know that there's great innovation happening by our classroom teachers and by our you know building principals and by and with great support from school boards and we know that uh, there's a lot of great work that's going out there this during these 12 days uh, that of school that are waived and we are you know grateful for for all of the leadership that's happening at the local level to make sure our students get a great education during this interesting time Governor, um, will you be signing off on that too, or will it be up to uh, Superintendent Basin? All right, we're going to be looking at them together, but we're going to we're going to review uh, next weekend all of those plans that are coming in and make sure they're meeting the the uh, criteria. And, and DPI has sent out a a, a set of uh, criteria that they're looking for uh, in those plans. So there's guidance on their website of what uh, needs to be included in those plans. The teams meet, present. The plans then you'll have a chance to look at yeah. them along with super the yeah, question was what's the process you know the teams meet the teams will meet and the teams will do go through uh, essentially the checklist the taxonomy the framework and say does it meet all of the plans if it doesn't they're going to be sending them back and saying hey we're missing some spots and we need to to fill those in uh, and then hopefully we'll be uh, you know seeing a a set of some really good interesting plans and and from that again one of the great things is there's there may be great ideas uh, that pop up from these that over the course of this spring we can share from one district to another share statewide because I, I know there's going to be some really innovative things that come from the work that's being done jacob i'd like to go back to the hospitalizations uh asking bluntly how are they uh Jacob's asking, how are the people that are hospitalized? I don't have an answer on that. And again, we, uh, I, 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 we're not intending to provide personal medical information uh, here. Uh, and, but, you know, our hearts go out to them. If you're uh, someone who's hospitalized with this disease, this is a serious thing. We know that there's, uh, in the rest of the world, there's, there's a mortality rate uh, that's significant uh, from this. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that families are very concerned about those loved ones that are in the hospital. And uh, we hope that uh, we recover, you know. We had one uh, coming in online in the back. And then Lane, yeah, after, next after you. Uh, for the Lieutenant Governor from Scott Hennon, adding the coronavirus impact to the already stressed oil, uh, oil and coal industries in North Dakota, what, what impact can we expect on state revenues? Uh, question is what impact on state revenues do we see from the coronavirus impact on uh, oil and coal industries? And as mentioned with, uh, with Dave Thompson, this is uh, something we're looking at as you speak, we'll ha we're looking for reports coming in from OMB on what an updated forecast could look like. But I was standing there thinking beforehand that the prairie dog numbers, the SIF numbers, the, the oil tax distribution numbers are heavily based on, on that oil price. And so that's actually an OPEC plus decision that we're looking for to see if that could make a positive impact on the oil price. Whereas sales tax, is also is is very has a lot of oil impact, but it also has just the general, the populace, which is what we're so concerned about with the corona impact now. The shutdown of these retail facilities, what what effect is that going to have on sales tax? So it's like two things happening at once. But the oil price, if we start seeing that move with 
if actions from, from the U.S. government, from OPEC plus with Russia and Saudi Arabia can have a positive impact, then you can see some drilling continue. But if the price stays the way we have it now, it seems like a repeat of the 2015, 16, 17 time period to me. And so I know what that felt like as a mayor. I know what that felt like coming down, talking to legislators and OMB at the time, governor at the time, and basically a sales tax and oil tax is dropping at the same time. So the planning we're doing is making sure that the budget stabilization being full, you know, what is the strategy for exercising our, our statute that we have, the statute ability, the ability we have under statute to, uh, re to have the allotments, bringing in funds back in the general fund with reduction of spending and then matching the drawdown of budget stabilization. And then it is, as, and separately, what does the oil tax impact look like? So it's, it is actually two different processes. So hopefully that answers Scott Ann's question. I, I would, it's a great answer by the Lieutenant Governor. I would just add to that that uh, we're, we in North Dakota should be grateful for the Supreme Court ruling a few years ago uh, that uh, paved the way for uh, all states to collect sales tax on online sales uh, because uh, you know it doesn't help a local retailer that may be shut down right now. Uh, small business owner, uh, they're in tough shape, but we know a lot of people at home are are doing a lot of online purchasing and so it'll be interesting to see the mix at the state level uh, that come what comes in from uh, you know how much is made up on online sales tax uh, versus on premise lane governor uh, several states have already issued a stay-at-home order have you thought about doing that and if not what would have to change for you to do so question was you know several states have issued the stay-at-home order uh, order and uh, what would it take for North Dakota to do this? Uh, as I've said at previous briefings, uh, it, it, I think it has to do with uh, with where we really see widespread community spread. Uh, if we think that the you know the the things that we've done to date and the personal responsibility that we talk about every day, uh, if that's not working, then you have to step it up. Uh, but I would would say for right now, uh, again, at, at the case rates that we're coming in right now, we feel like the, the controls we have in place uh, are putting that curve on a level where uh, the future cases and the future critical cases are going to be below uh, what our medical capacity is. So right now we feel we're on a path, but this is something we monitor We monitor every day uh, to try to do that. But again, uh, you know, we'd love to not have to go to that because if everybody's exercising personal responsibility, then maybe we, we're going to have you know fewer government mandates. Jacob? Uh, my final question, I promise. In a reference to the uh, frost laws, obviously over the fall and winter, there is a lot of excessive moisture that put a lot of uh, county roads in danger. With lifting these weight restrictions, is there concern that it might expedite how quickly these roads wear down come springtime? Uh, Jacob's asking the question about the frost laws and and uh, given the heavy moisture content last fall, the frost going out, uh, you know, could this rapidly deteriorate some of our state roads? Uh, and the answer is, yeah, it's something we have to watch out for. I mean, it's the reason why frost laws exist because when you've uh, got the frost going out uh, and it creates a uneven structure and then you got heavy loads working over it that's what can really deteriorate that's the why frost laws exist uh, so we uh, so so that's why we've included in that order for the head of NDDOT as part of the executive order he can put those weight restrictions back on if we see that there's a section of road because we we don't want to be uh, overly short-sighted here we're trying to help out uh, <clears throat> industry who may be because uh, it's back to a staffing. I mean, why why raise the load limits? I mean, we've already gotten feedback. This executive order went out at, at uh, you know, like an hour before this conference. We're already getting feedback from in industry by saying hallelujah, because if you're short of drivers, uh, this is one way. Uh, and if you can run on your regular summer load limits during the spring, uh, it helps you with your workforce shortage. Uh, it helps moving, you know, goods and transportation and food, because we know there's a lot of demand on the food supply chain coming in. Uh, so that's why that's why we're doing this. But I, I would say you've also heard Brent and I talk a lot about the importance of automatically collected information. Uh, one of the things that we did, we do have a project going on in McKinsey County uh, in the heart of the Bakken where we've got uh, the WISE road system, W-I-S-E, uh, which is the weather information uh, system we're talking about. And we've now, for the first time ever, we've got about over 50 
fr frost probes that are over five feet deep that go into the ground so we can actually make data-driven decisions and that kind of uh, that kind of data collection if we had that statewide then we wouldn't be you know picking a date off the calendar for a frost law saying hey you can drive after may 1st we would know whether or not the frost was out and so again i envision a future for north dakota where we'll be doing data collection where you might not even need these executive orders because we'll have real we'll have real data lane we had a couple questions from uh viewers earlier today the first one being with it getting warmer out and nicer with spring coming up, is there any concern for snowbirds returning from areas like Arizona and Florida? And do you think that'll spike the number of uh, positive cases here in North Dakota? The uh, question was uh, with uh, warmer weather coming and all the, uh, uh, the snowbirds, as they're called, uh, people returning from Florida, Arizona, and North Dakotans that may winter down there, do we have any risk for, uh, for transmission? I think anytime we've got travel, uh, with people coming, uh, you know, into our state, uh, we would ask them to, you know, the same appropriate thing. If you've got, it uh, doesn't matter if you've been a resident of North Dakota for 50, 60, 70 years, and you feel fine, if you're coming from a hot spot area, or you think you may have had contact with someone who was a positive case, uh, when uh, we would ask those people when they come to North Dakota to practice all of the things we talked about here in terms of uh, personal responsibility, but maybe even further. I do know people that have returned. Uh, I know college kids that have come back to our state and they're practicing self-isolation for 14 days. I mean, they got themselves set up and they're really making sure they reduce their contact. So I, I think that that's uh, just good uh, public health practice uh, if people can do that. Uh, but again, uh, they may, uh, some people I know may come back because they want to come back to a place where they see fewer positives than in Florida or Arizona. But I also have know people that are saying, hey, we're comfortable where we are, we're set up and we're just going to stay here and they might extend their time. So I think we're going to, we, we may see, uh, an acceleration of some coming back. We may say some that just stay where they are and shelter in place in uh, warmer states for a longer period of time. Net, net, uh, net, net, North Dakotans are always welcome here and, and uh, we want to take care of everybody. But w if you're coming back or you've lived here the whole winter, uh, same rules apply about personal responsibility. And the uh, second question was about cashiers at grocery stores um, and their fear of contracting the virus from touching all the things that the shopper has touched. Do you encourage grocery stores to promote more of their uh, self-checkouts in this time? Uh, question was, uh, you know, checkout uh, personnel at grocery stores and the possible risk of transmission from touching foods or cans or other products that others may have. Uh, you, you know, I, I think it's a... a the self in the part of the question was what do you think about self checkout i think self checkout's great uh because uh you know this is one of the ways in a state where we had 30,000 jobs open 3 weeks ago and we're short of labor uh one of the ways to do that is to you know automate tasks that you know any wherever we can uh and that's certainly one of those tasks that can be automated where people can do that self checkout so i think that's a i think we're going to see uh, I, I said in an earlier press conference, disruption like this creates an opportunity for innovation and it actually accelerates innovation. And I think that we're gonna see whether it's in education, uh, in terms of delivery of academic missions, whether it's in healthcare through telemedicine, uh, whether it's more self-checkout. I think, I think we're gonna see a step function shift in terms of adoption rates of these things because once people say hey that was a, that wasn't a good idea just when you're having a pandemic that's just a good idea period so i think we'll see more of that but i would encourage uh, all of those uh, employers to make sure that you know they're protecting their um, their employees and uh and if they feel they've got to do you know, masks and gloves for people that are in high contact situations i mean that's totally appropriate for the employer to think about doing that one more coming in online. From April Baumgarten, uh, with uh, state employees potentially going into homes to visit with clients, what measures is the state taking to make sure um, state team members and their clients are safe? A uh, question from April Bumgardner was, with state team members going into people's home to meet with clients, um, I'm, I'm, uh, what precautions are we taking? Uh, I'm not sure what state function would be causing people to go into people's homes but uh, maybe my lens got if that relates to the health department or is there anything does april have any other drill down on if she was here i could ask her but uh, social services or behavioral health social services behavioral health uh my do you want to 
talk about precautions we're taking to protect state employees? So the Department of Health has been uh, working with the Department of Human Services and all of our partners that do deliver home care uh, services in the home. And the precautions that we, you've heard the governor talk about, washing your hands, stay home when you're sick, calling ahead and seeing if there's anyone sick in the household, um, doing all those uh, social distancing things to help protect themselves. Uh, that's been our advice to individuals. Uh, how many of the 300 Cass County tests have come back? Uh, based on the best information that I have before I, I came in here is that I think there's about uh, still 270 of those pending. Uh, and we say Cass County, they were taken in Cass County, but uh, we don't know of those pending. Those are pending from uh, the Quest lab that we talked about earlier. They were sent to a national lab. They're still held up, but a number of those could have also be Minnesota, but they were collected in in Cass County, but we there, and then we know that uh, testing is accelerating in Cass County uh, at the the local site. We're going to roll those numbers into the state numbers, uh, but there's a. Uh, uh, another set of tests that were taken yesterday when they started to ramp up their testing. Uh, so there's those uh, 270 plus more uh, that are still pending. Uh, so again, if you've got the possibility of as many as uh, 350 or more tests pending in Cass County, again, I would just say, uh, as I said at the beginning, if you are someone who's been tested you should be self-isolating until you get the results because you 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 likely had all the things that Mylin talked about uh, if you were if you were to got tested if you are in close contact with someone who's waiting for their test to come back you should be isolating if you know somebody or worked with somebody uh, that that is that has told you that they are going and getting tested you should probably be self-isolating uh, and you can uh, again we're trying to get a team out there to do contact tracing to try to go back and, and connect with who might have been in contact with me. But again, on personal responsibility, uh, for those 300 plus people with tests pending in that county, uh, we, we could, if all those, if depending on how those came back, we could be having a very different press briefing tomorrow. So again, we would just ask everybody to, that's in that bucket to, uh, you know, the, the best way to, to act is when you're waiting for your test is presume it's positive and act accordingly and then be super relieved when it's negative. Uh, but again, that's what personal responsibility is, is taking the, the, the most uh, thoughtful course of action. Okay, I think that wraps it up for today. Uh, but again, uh, thanks to the uh, uh, media that's present uh, here. Thanks for the questions that are coming online. Thanks to all the people that are watching. Thanks for everybody that's doing a great job on on personal responsibility. And, uh, and again, uh, when we talked about gratitude today, keep encouraging people when you've got, if you've got a little extra time as we move through this, if you have an opportunity to thank someone in your life that's made a difference, uh, now is a great time to do that. I also wanna also give a shout out again to my Lynn, give me the, uh, my closing uh, comments on the, uh, quit sm the quit smoking, quit vaping topic. Uh, COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. The people that are dying uh, are dying a, uh, you know, due to a respiratory function. Uh, and, and one of the, this is, there's never been a better time to quit smoking and quit vaping than right now. And we do have a, uh, a quit line. And can somebody get that for me? Know it by heart, put it up on the thing. <laughs> Someone's looking it up right now. It's on the North Dakota Department of Health website, uh, but there are resources there on the website. Uh, if you go to the Department of Health website, you can go there and get all the resources to help you quit and quit now. And people might say it's hard. Yeah, it's hard, but there's a lot of benefits. And, and the benefits actually start accruing quite rapidly after you quit. And phoning a friend, it's coming up here now. I see we got it, it's being delivered. Boy, wow, that is, how could I have forgot that? 1-800-QUIT-NOW, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Uh, I don't even think we even had to write that one down. But anyway, uh, that's a closing thought today. And uh, uh, so gratitude and quit smoking is what we're wrapping up with today. So, and quit vaping too, because vaping puts stuff in your lungs that you don't want to have in your lungs. Okay, uh, be healthy, be safe. Uh, thanks for practicing personal responsibility. We'll see you all tomorrow at four o'clock.